Today we're going to discover how wrath is the key to connecting the puzzle pieces of Revelation. We're going to learn how to connect the wrath and the sixth seal, to the wrath and the seven bulls of wrath, to the wrath and the seventh trumpet, to give us the big picture of Revelation. We're also going to do a scriptural overview of the seven seals of Revelation and much, much more. So get ready, because the veil is literally lifting. First, we're going to do an overview of the seven seals and align wrath in the seals with wrath in the bowls. Here's our big picture of the seven seals. And the only time that wrath occurs within the seven seals is within the sixth seal. And so this is where we're going to insert the seven bowls of wrath where the word wrath occurs. And so here's our big picture of the seven seals connected to the seven bowls, aligning wrath with wrath. And now for just a quick overview of the seven seals. In Revelation chapter four and five, we have this amazing opening vision and view of what's going on in heaven before the seven seals are opened. The Lamb is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, and the 24 elders around the throne are offering the prayers of the saints. Friends, make sure your prayers join and participate in spirit and in truth in this amazing heavenly vision in the very near future. And make sure your prayers are in harmony with God's will and judgments expressed in the seven seals. In seal number one, we have a rider on a white horse, given a bow and a crown, riding to conquer and to complete his conquest. Now many folks out there want to call the rider on the white horse the Antichrist, but these individuals offer zero scriptures to support their case. And at the same time, they want us to ignore the over 30 scriptures that connect the rider of the white horse to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Now we have a link to all of these scriptures in the description box below. Now some may be wondering, yeah, he's got a bow and he's got a crown, but where are his arrows? When we go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and Ezekiel chapter 5, we learn that Jesus' arrows are seal 2, the sword, seal 3, famine, and seal 4, sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast. And so Jesus is not missing his arrows at all. His arrows are seal 2, seal 3, and seal 4. In seal 2, we have a rider on a red horse, given a great sword, taking peace away from the earth so that men would kill one another. In seal three, we have a rider on a black horse, given a pair of scales, measuring out a quart of wheat and barley for a day's wage. Now that's a lot of work for a little bit of food. In seal number four, we have a pale green horse with two riders. Death and Hades were given authority to kill a fourth of the earth by means of sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast. By today's population numbers, that's 1.75 billion people. To the world and Christians disconnected from God's word, this is gonna seem like the end. But at Matthew 24, verse eight, Jesus referred to this time period as just the beginning of birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows. In addition to Revelation chapter 6, there are five other places in the Bible where God mentions sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast in combination in the same chapter. In these five other places, God offers his instructions, encouragement, reasons, and food in due season for those alive during this time period. One amazing fact is that in all five of these occurrences, God's not firing these arrows at the world. In all five places, God's targeting his people. This emphasizes the need for us to repent before the beginning of birth pangs. Otherwise, we may find ourselves a target of God's arrows. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin, not with the world, but at the household of God. In seal number five, we have the slaughtered souls under the altar for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And they're crying to God in a loud voice, when are you gonna judge and avenge our blood? God gives them a white robe and tells them to rest until the number was filled of their brothers who are about to be killed as they also had been. Now God gives a very clear answer to the martyr's question, when are you gonna judge and avenge our blood in the seven bowls of wrath? 
bowl too is poured out on the sea, and it becomes the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea dies. Then in bowl number three, the vial is poured out on the rivers and the springs, and they became blood. Then in Revelation 16 it says, For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and look what God does. And you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Verse 7 says, And I heard the altar, yes, the altar in seal 5, where the martyrs are crying out. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And so in bowl number two and three, God gives the martyrs a very clear answer to when he's going to judge their blood. And in the seventh and final bowl of wrath, when God remembers and judges Babylon the Great, there at Revelation 19.2 it says, For he has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And so in bowl two, three, and seven, God gives a very clear answer to the martyr's question on when are you gonna judge and avenge our blood? How beautiful. Now Jesus himself gives a second witness of this timing and sequence of events at Matthew chapter 24 and verse seven and eight. And there he says, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And then in verse 9, Jesus brings in seal 5. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And so in Matthew 24, as well as the seven seals, God tells us the same thing twice. Continuing on with the sixth seal, which starts out with a great earthquake. The sun goes black, the moon blood red, the stars fell from heaven to the earth. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and every island and mountain were removed from their places. Then everyone on the earth hid themselves in the caves and the rock masses, hiding from the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So here we have aligned the seven bowls of wrath to the only place in the seven seals where the word wrath occurs, connecting wrath with wrath. Most Christians think that this is the end of the sixth seal, completely subtracting chapter seven. But the seventh seal isn't opened until chapter eight, and so the sixth seal includes all of chapter seven. In the first part, we learn the four winds of destruction are not to be released until the angels have sealed 144,000. According to Revelation 7.3, the angels do the sealing, not man sealing himself. Unfortunately, the current pattern of most religions today is to self-appoint, self-anoint, or self-seal themselves, leaving no room for the angels to do the sealing. In trumpet number five and woe number one, God brings severe judgment on these men. There, the locusts are instructed to torture the men without the seal for five months with the torment of a scorpion sting when it strikes a man. Revelation 9, 6 says, And in those days men shall seek death, but not find it. They shall desire to die, but death shall flee from them. For all of these men, self-appointing and self-anointing and self-sealing, God is going to target them in trumpet 5 and woe number 1. So it's best to leave the sealing to the angels. Now after this sealed number of 144,000, the sixth seal mentions a great multitude that no man could number. Chapter seven says they come out of the great tribulation and then the lamb shepherds and guides them to springs of living water, which we know occurs during the thousand year reign. So when we don't subtract chapter seven, we see that the sixth seal includes the language of the thousand year reign. And in Revelation chapter 8, we have the seventh seal, where the seven angels are given seven trumpets. Okay, here again is the big picture of the seven seals connected with the seven bowls of wrath, aligning wrath in the sixth seal to wrath in the seven bowls. And now we're going to get a second perspective of this connection and enlarge the seven bowls so that we can see them. First, we're going to make some room. Now we're going to enlarge the seven bowls, still maintaining the connection and alignment of wrath to wrath. And now we're going to push down this thousand year reign language because we know that this happens after the seven bowls of wrath. 
and we're going to push down the seventh seal. And so here is our second perspective with the seven bulls of wrath enlarged so we can see them with the thousand year reign language pushed down. And our first perspective, wrath still connected with wrath. This look is more compact and compressed, namely in the sixth seal. And then back to our second perspective, wrath connected with wrath with the seven bulls enlarged, the thousand year reign language pushed down as well as the seventh seal. Our first big picture, wrath to wrath compact. Our second perspective, same big picture, wrath to wrath enlarged. Now this perspective is amazing because it shows the vastness of the sixth seal. And so here is just the sixth seal. It starts at the end of chapter six with an earthquake and the sun, moon, and stars. It includes the time of wrath and the seven bulls of wrath in chapter 15 and 16. Here are the small bulls inserted. Here are the large bulls inserted and includes in chapter seven, the thousand year reign. Wow. In chapter seven, John sees a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Verse 14 continues, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Verse 15 says they serve him day and night in his temple. And here we have a picture of Ezekiel's temple, which will be rebuilt during the thousand year reign. Verse 16 says they will hunger no more, nor thirst anymore. The sun will not strike them nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd and lead them to living fountains of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here the sixth seal is incorporating the very same language used at the end of Revelation and the very end of our Bible. In Revelation 21, John sees a new heavens, a new earth, and the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And verse four says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And so the sixth seal takes us all the way to the new heavens and the new earth, where there's no more hunger, heat, thirst, crying, pain, mourning, and no more death, because the Lamb is guiding them to springs of living water. And this is why the seven trumpets don't occur after the seven seals. It would make no sense to have no more hunger, no thirst, no pain, no mourning, no crying, no death, and then to re-unleash the incredible destruction and devastation and burning that occurs during the seven trumpets. This is also the reason why many deceivers want to subtract chapter seven. Instead, for God's big picture, we're gonna align wrath to wrath to wrath using wrath to connect the seven seals to the seven trumpets to the seven bowls of wrath. Wrath in the sixth seal to wrath in the seven bowls of wrath connected with wrath in the seventh trumpet. And here's the big picture. This perspective has the seven bowls enlarged so we can see them with the thousand year reign language pushed down for the seven seals as well as the seven trumpets. And because we're connecting the sixth seal to the seventh trumpet or aligning six to seven, it gives us an offset of one. In a minute, we're gonna see how the Song of Moses sung in the opening vision of the seven bowls of wrath actually presents the offset. Now over to our second and more compact perspective where the seven bowls of wrath are small and inserted into the sixth seal where the word wrath occurs. And now we're gonna add in the seven trumpets aligning wrath to wrath to wrath, wrath in the sixth seal connected to the seven bowls of wrath aligned with wrath in the seventh trumpet also connected to the seven bowls of wrath, wrath to wrath to wrath. And so here is our big picture, merging the seven seals with the seven trumpets with the seven bowls. Again, we have this offset of one because we've connected six to seven, wrath in the sixth seal to wrath in the seventh trumpet, which gives us an offset of one. But again, we're gonna see how the song of Moses sung in the opening vision of the seven bowls of wrath, sung at Deuteronomy chapter 32, presents this offset. 
In our next video, we're going to do an overview of the seven trumpets, and we're going to see how both Songs of Moses honors both appearances of the rider on the white horse, Jesus Christ. We're going to see how the Song of Moses, recorded at Deuteronomy chapter 32, sung at Revelation 15:3, sounds two trumpets, trumpet number one and two, announcing the coronation of the riding and conquering king, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, thus presenting the offset. We're also going to see how the Song of Moses and the Song of Miriam also honors the King of Kings and Lord of Lords when he returns with the army of riders on white horses in the Sixth Bowl of Wrath at Armageddon.